The Demon Headmaster is one of the most memorable British children's programs produced in the 90s. It's certainly on my top 20 of stuff I used to watch when I was a youngster, ranking somewhere between number 20 and number 18. I'm sorry if that's too low for some of you, but it's not my fault my childhood home entertainment was filled with the likes of Open All Hours and Chaplin. It also could never compete with a series like Shoebox Zoo, as not only did that take place in Scotland, but it featured Rick Mail. Ah! Be prepared! The scenario involves a pack of plucky children trying to stop their headteacher from brainwashing the entire country into thinking, talking, and acting like robots. He nearly achieves this as he has the power to hypnotize simply by looking you in the eyes. The prefix are the voice of the headmaster. They must be obeyed. Produced between 1996 and 1998, the TV series was based on four books written by Gillian Cross. Although the seven Demon Headmaster stories are undoubtedly her most popular creation, she has typed up over 40 other books between 1979 and last year. I suppose there's a chance you could be a British child of today and never heard of this book series. It was, after all, published way back in 1982. And in 1998. And in 2004. And in 2009. And in 2017. Okay, this book has updated its cover more often than Terence Hill and Bud Spencer made movies together. It's funny because they made, like... I don't know, ten? Well, if you have managed to avoid all five of these editions and the TV series, you might find yourself performing the story in front of an audience, as it was adapted into a stage play. And not just any play, but a musical. I can't remember if the first time I watched it was when it originally aired, which isn't surprising since I was only five, but I definitely caught the repeats throughout the noughties, and rented the first instalment at least once from my local library. The overtly sinister title character was played by Terence Hardiman, an actor whose career highlights include Softly Softly, Secret Army, Crown Court, and cameoing as Sergeant Wilson a year prior to the Demon Headmaster in an episode of Goodnight Sweetheart. When I saw Who Framed Roger Rabbit for the first time, I actually thought Judge Doom was being played by Terence Hardiman. The other main adult was played by Tessa Peake Jones, aka Raquel from the second era of Only Fools and Horses. I do wonder if part of the reason for the casting of this particular actress was her slight resemblance to the author. The rest of the cast were unsurprisingly children, or possibly munchkins, aged between 10 and 15, most of whom hadn't acted for mainstream television before, and for a few of them, since. Now before I get to the riff reviewing, I do need to point out that this isn't one of my Spot the Difference episodes. I will compare this teleprogram to Gillian Cross's original book, Someday. Someday! So if you're a fan of the original books, please don't get annoyed that I'm not mentioning any adaptation alterations. Instead, get annoyed because I'm being a snarky prick. We begin with the show's intro, showing the main characters being hypnotised by the editor's use of the ripple effect. Meet the Hunter family. Harvey, the cuddly-looking hybrid between Percy and the first member of the barely-seen-or-heard-from-again engines, Lloyd, who is suffering from angsty older brother syndrome, and their mum. Hmm. Surprisingly, I guess Adele was able to get custody of Damien. There is a bit of tension going on at the house as the hunters are awaiting the arrival of the child they've adopted. She'll be one of them. What do you mean? One of them. Good to see you, I was just Good going. Timing. And the award for most abrupt scene ending goes to... I'm shocked that the BBC felt it was acceptable for a man to give a quick flash in a children's show. Also, of all the internet sensations to reference, why did it have to be Logan Bloody Paul? What are you, a robot? Go on, say something. I'm Diana Glass. I'm 11. My parents both died when I was one. Thank you for proving that you are a robot, and this is her before being hypnotised. Spoilers. 
As if losing her parents wasn't tragic enough, Dinah is five years too early to appear in the story of Tracy Beaker. The boys then watch their favourite program, The Eddie Hare Show, featuring Sue. But Dinah is much more of a get-your-own-back fan. School time, and Dinah discovers that rather than juvenile banter, all the children in the playground huddle into groups of eight, where they recite different subjects from maths to foreign languages. This lengthy shot is like the birds and Gone with the Wind combined, to make something that's not quite as good as either. Dinah is confronted by the school Gestapo, Rose and Jeff, and their eerie catchphrase. Prepare for trouble! Make it double! She is marched to the head office where she and we meet the head, and cloaked in black torso, of the headmaster. This is a test. It is given to all new pupils. You will do it. Now. This man could make Malcolm Tucker and Judge Frollo quiver. Funny you should be so tired. So early in the morning. You think being tired at nine o'clock in the morning is funny? Try broadening your outlook with some John Schwartzwelder. And wait, is she being hypnotised or just falling asleep at the sound of his soothing creepiness? They only had the budget to create green spirals for either both his eyes or one eye each. Later, Dinah wakes up with no memory of her brief encounter of the twirly kind. Don't go calling the pedo busters just yet. I'm sure all the head had her do whilst hypnotised was help him try to decrypt the school timetable. At lunch, Dinah meets Lloyd and Harvey's friends, Mandy, Ian and Ingrid. What do you think of him then? I think the headmaster is a marvellous man, and this is the best school I've ever been to. I bet he said you were to go into the hall after dinner. Well, yes, he did. Doesn't everyone? We don't. At the assembly, the headmaster puts the whole gathering of students and teachers into a trance, but Dinah, proving herself to be smarter than a 40-year-old, averts her eyes, which unfortunately doesn't go unnoticed. Look at me. I know what you want, Dinah. Trust me. And then he swallowed her whole. <laughs> In case you haven't figured it out, all the teachers and students are under the control of the headmaster, except for Lloyd, Harvey, Ingrid, Ian and Mandy. But why are they apparently immune from his hypnosis? Well, it isn't made all that clear, but it is implied that either they are too strong-willed and disobedient to succumb to his look-into-my-eyes instructions, or they are the lowest scoring pupils at the school, and thus he feels not worthy of his time. Or, he's got to make sure there's somebody to foil his evil scheme. It was a film about ants. It was very interesting. So evil. Frankly, I can see a massive upside to a school where nobody gets bullied, and all the knowledge gets pumped into your brain whilst you are in a state of trance. And all you have to do is sacrifice your free will. During his pee break, Uranus. Harvey spies on the assembly, and the head teacher teaching astronomy. Neptune and Pluto. Oh no! That doesn't really lead to anything major. After school, the friends have a shed house meeting. Shed houses are a lot like tree houses, only for children with acrophobia. What are we going to do about her? Well, she's not one of us, that's for sure. Huh? So she's one of the enemy. Well, I see no other logical option. Guess we'll have to kill ourselves. Meanwhile, Tessapeak Jones is busy sanding down a piece of scenery so in episode 3, Eddie Hare can eat it. I think the headmaster is a marvellous man, and this is the best school I've ever been to. It's not what they say, I can tell you. You should hear some of the tales they come home with. Mummy, the headmaster is really strict. Mummy, the headmaster is really creepy. Mummy, the headmaster touched me inappropriately. Do they expect me to believe my own children? Ha! It was a film about ants. It was very interesting. I didn't see any film. No projector. No screen. Were you spying for over 20 seconds? Less than 20 seconds. Then you've proved nothing! I dare you, Dinah Glass. Break a rule. Tomorrow. 
And so Dinah stayed up all night learning hot break into rules tips from that Fairly Odd Parents video game. The next morning, the kids awake to find they are in episode two. Just me? Look! But before she can make a snowball to throw, Harvey finds he just can't control his primal urges. And since there's no poo handy, he throws the snow instead. Harvey! No! Exterminate! And they would have gotten away with it if it weren't for Ian drawing attention to them. Stop, don't come back. The siblings are subjected to cruel and a tad ironic punishment. You'll sweep the snow from the playground into a heap. You will then make the whole heap into a pile of snowballs. I do wonder whether these two are acting under their own subconscious while still being in a trance, or if the hypnotizing headmaster gave them instructions for every possible occasion. Did those fuckers just give me the finger? Like snow, do we? Like playing with it. Think they've had enough of snow yet, Rose? Scott Tenemin, that's who he reminds me of. I can't believe I almost let that reference skip by. Sorry, where were we? You know, pushing us into a pile of snow after having us freeze our tits off out here and during literal back-breaking labour is kind of redundant. I don't give a shit. I don't give a fuck. You won't get away with it. We'll tell Mrs. Hunter when we get home. There'll be a scandal. You'll be prosecuted. Hmm. Huh. I forgot this series only lasted two episodes. Nope, because they don't leave the school straight away. They actually carry on with their lessons. And even Dinah goes to another one of the headmaster's assemblies off screen. Which means... At school this morning, we all made snowballs and had a snowball fight. It was great. On the plus side, Mrs. Hunter has almost finished sanding down that wood. Harvey's second punishment is to answer some sums, and, providing they are all correct, there will not be a third. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll never be able to do these. Give them here. Sweet, a rare lasagna cat promo. That night, the boys discover Dinah's shameful secret. She is a maths prodigy. What do you think it's like, being cleverer than anyone else? How would you like it? No thanks. As long as you don't deliberately rub it into people's faces all the time, being a genius would surely have more advantages than disadvantages. Especially now they're going to need someone to write Stephen Hawking's next novel. Got you guessing. That's how I like it. Kid, you're a faggot. Remember. 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 Go on. Remember. Go on, remember. Remember. It's coming. Remember. Hypnotism! That's it! Hypnotism! So now we know. And knowing is half the battle. He's got the whole school in his power. Except us. Hope you enjoyed those two sentences as we get to hear them again one minute later. He's got the whole school in his power. Except us. You are very tired. You are so very, very tired. Hope you enjoyed that impression because it's something Lloyd does at least once in all three seasons. Tomorrow we are going to plan to take over the world. Funny that you should be so sleepy. But it turns out the crafty old creep gave Harvey the cacophony of calculations because he knew Dinah would help him, and he wanted extra confirmation, besides the opening test, of how clever she really is. There's a plot! They're full fuck! Splat forever! And what is splat? Society for the protection of our lives against them. I could have sworn it was secretly propelling leprechauns against trees. It's a pity we can't bug the hole. Oh, ha, ha. Don't scoff at that. It was a legitimately good idea. And it's actually what they end up doing, only with a tape recorder hidden in Dinah's pocket. I feel like Big Brother's watching me. Who? Big Brother. He spied on everyone. It's in that book. Oh, you mean that Goon Show episode 1985? What a classic. Our heroine may be hypnotised, but it looks like they've outsmarted the man in black this time, and god damn it. Take your hand out of your pocket at once. I can see that I shall have to deal with you once and for all. I'll poke her so full of pins she dies from internal bleeding. <laughs> it's funny because her nickname is Die. <laughs>
Episode 3, and our heroine is being reprimanded by her teacher for helping Harvey with his punishment. He'd have been punished if they weren't done, and now he's going to be punished because they are. Fairness is an illusion designed to create disorder. Don't forget to pre-order a copy of your headmaster's next book, Fascism for Dummies. The headmaster has plans for you. I need an adult. I am an adult. Anyway, let's hear what that tape has to say. Ein Feind und ein Reich und ein deutsches Volk Sieg! The headmaster's plan is to put his three smartest students on the children's quiz slash subpar vaudevillian cack show starring Eddie Hare. Gotcha getting? That's how I like it! I can't believe my primary school went to see this show without me! Watch you don't burn your brains out, genius. Thinking's bad for your football, remember? On second thoughts, I'd rather watch In the Night Garden, narrated by Megan Mullally. By the way, if this host looks familiar, that's because he's being played by Danny John Jules, who has played main characters in Red Dwarf, Death in Paradise, the first series of M.I. High, and a voice in the CGI revival of Bob the Builder. The questions are immensely difficult, thus only a child as clever as Dinah Glass could have a hope of answering them. The head teacher of the winning school gets to give his message of inspiration to the nation, much to the headmaster's delight. He says the whole country! His plan is only going to affect about 12% of this country's population, and if they're dumb enough to watch this crap, they deserve a little mind manipulation. He's power mad. He's already got the whole school under his thumb. Except us. Please, Harvey, not again. And so, on the day of the recording, Team Splat lock the filming crew and their equipment in an alley and give all the teachers a bath. <laughs> Meanwhile, Lloyd and Dinah lock the prefects in their office. Only Rosie and Jim are missing. I think we should call the police. And tell them what? Four simple words. He touched my breasts. Just as Splat are about to dismantle the school's fuse box, Mr. Terminator arrives, along with Mr. and Mrs. Snooty. I see I have not overestimated your intelligence. I won't do it! I'll get all the answers wrong! Probably should have installed a, when I snap my fingers, you will snap into an obedient trance trigger. I think you will find I am always a move ahead. Well, I've read the book this is based on. That puts me over ten years ahead of you. You will pull them to pieces. <laughs> Fifty quid on splat! Don't do it! Whatever you say, just stop them! Children, stop! You bastards! If you break your promise, all I have to say is destroy the dolls and they will be dead. And you'll be arrested. Oh no, wait, every single person in Britain watches a children's quiz show, especially the police. Let's get quizzing. Got you guessing? <laughs> if I hear, got you guessing? One more time today, I think I'm going to scream. Now, what, and I'll repeat that, what, and I'll repeat that, what, and I'll repeat that. What? Shut the fuck up! Nine questions each later, and the teams are still neck and neck. What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Could it be daffodils? The right answer! Higgitus, diggitus, sambukazi. I want your attention, everything. All this mass hypnosis malarkey gives Harvey a fantastic idea and gives Dinah constipation. It looks like all's well that ends well. <laughs> oh right, the man who threatened to murder you all is on the loose. Next time, I shall win. And I shall not forgive you. You're about as dignified in defeat as Basil Fawlty. <laughs> anyway, all's well that ends, damn it. Mrs. Hunter tells me that you haven't really settled in here. Don't you think it might be better for everyone 
they went back to the home. But of course, Lloyd now doesn't want her to leave, and may I say you acted a little premature there, Mrs. Hunter. The passage of time in these episodes hasn't been crystal clear, but you've surely only been fostering her for less than two weeks. So, you're happy to stay then, Dinah? Yes, please. <laughs> Got you guessing? That's how I like it! Ah! The end. Wait, that's it? Three episodes? I know this is a UK television series, but that's still cutting it rather short. Just kidding, there's another three episodes to come. The six episodes were split from the first book and its first sequel, The Prime Minister's Brain. Although having the contents of the book reduced down to three 25-minute episodes, the events of the story don't feel rushed. Even watching this show as a child, what I could not believe is that the children didn't even attempt to contact or explain the situation to the police. When I was about 11, I actually attempted to write a sort of fanfic where they did call the police, but the detectives who showed up were Thompson and Thompson. While I of course don't approve of his mind control policy, I do approve of his school uniform policy. In comparison to the next three stories and next season, this one is the least complex. What's the matter with these kids? Why aren't they cheering? They can cheer if you want them to. So what'll the headmaster's revenge be? And will this series ever do a crossover with Biker Grove? This is Jeffrey Kitch saying, if a teacher ever walks up to you saying you're looking tired, punch them in the face. Repeat after me. I think Jeffrey Kitch's videos are marvellous. And this is the best YouTube channel you could ever subscribe to.